The Western powers are increasingly engaged in conflict with Russia and China, and what we're essentially seeing is a new Cold War. However, not every country is being affected in the same way, and Europe in particular is suffering economically from this new Cold War, while the United States benefits, it is essentially destroying Germany's economy. Today I'm going to be looking at a series of reports that demonstrate how the heart of the German economy, which is its heavy industry, is being devastated by this geopolitical conflict, and Germany is at the center of Europe's economy. So this is going to have significant reverberations across the continent. Germany is officially in recession. Its GDP shrank by 0.3%. And this article in The Guardian notes that Germany is on track to be in recession for at least two years, and it attributes this recession to higher energy costs, weaker industrial demand, higher interest rates, and elevated living costs. The financial press has been warning that German industry is being destroyed, and as Bloomberg put it, quote, Germany's days as an industrial superpower are coming to an end. Bloomberg noted that manufacturing output in Europe's biggest economy has been trending downward since 2017, and it quoted the CEO of a German company that creates machinery for manufacturing, and he said, quote, there's not a lot of hope, if I'm honest. And Bloomberg isolated three particular factors being the main reasons driving the deindustrialization of Germany. One, the U.S. is drifting away from Europe and is seeking to compete with its European allies for climate investment. I'll be speaking about the U.S. government's policies and in particular the trillions of dollars worth of subsidies and tax breaks that the U.S. government is offering through the Inflation Reduction Act. Furthermore, another significant factor is that China is becoming a bigger rival and is no longer an insatiable buyer of German goods. And as the West's economic war on China, as part of this new Cold War, as that heats up, that's also backfiring hard on German industry. And finally, I think the most important factor is the end of huge volumes of cheap Russian natural gas, which has significantly increased the cost of manufacturing production in Germany. It's also significantly increased the costs of living in Germany and energy prices, electricity bills have skyrocketed in Germany, which have really hurt purchasing power. And that has also depressed local demand, which is another reason fueling the recession, because people are spending more and more money simply on paying their bills, which means that there, there is significantly decreased aggregate demand in the economy. People are not going out to restaurants as much and buying products and consuming. And then finally, the loss of cheap Russian gas means that the cost of manufacturing has increased a lot, and that means that German exports are much less competitive and its exports have been declining. Furthermore, Bloomberg noted that other factors include decreasing investment, public investment in infrastructure and education, and this reflects that the Western governments have been moving more toward neoliberal policies for decades, decreasing social spending on things like healthcare, education, and investment. And now we're seeing that this is backfiring because as the state invests less in social services, that means that workers have to spend more of their paycheck on things like education and healthcare, and that means that there, once again, is a decrease in aggregate demand in the economy. But again, the issue of energy is of the utmost importance. Bloomberg noted that the energy crisis in the summer of 2022 was a major catalyst. And they say the energy crisis, as if we can't explain what happened. What happened in 2022? Of course, the war in Ukraine and the Western sanctions on Russia, which have backfired hard and hurt European economies, there's a chart in this Bloomberg article that shows how power bills have skyrocketed across the European Union, but especially in Germany, you can see that energy prices have more than doubled. And furthermore, 
Bloomberg notes that one of the hardest hit sectors has been chemicals, which is a direct result of Germany's loss of cheap Russian gas. And this recalls a very revealing comment that was made by the EU foreign policy chief, Josep Borrell, back in 2022. He admitted that for decades, the low inflation enjoyed by European economies was largely a product of cheap Russian gas and also access to the massive Chinese market as China was growing very significantly in the 90s and 2000s and had an insatiable appetite for exports from Germany and other European economies. And now with the growing geopolitical tensions and the new Cold War that the West is waging against both Russia and China, the EU is destroying the very base of its economy. This is that very revealing comment from Joseph Borrell, the EU foreign policy chief. So our prosperity was based on China and Russia. Energy, a market. You, U.S. takes care of our security. You, China and Russia provide the basis of our prosperity. This is a world that is no longer there. Our prosperity has been based on cheap energy coming from Russia. Russian gas, cheap and suppose affordable and secure and stable, which has been proved not the case, and the access to the big China market for exports and imports, for technological uh, transfer, for investment and for having cheap goods. I think that the Chinese workers with their low salaries has done much better and much more to contain inflation than all the central banks together. Now, specifically in the case of Germany, it would be difficult to overstate how important exports are to the German economy. For decades, Germany was one of the world's leading industrial powers. And despite the fact that manufacturing production has been significantly declining since 2017, it still is a major part of German exports. According to the latest data from the German government, in 2023, 17.2% of its total exports consisted of motor vehicles and parts. And of course, the German car industry is very prominent internationally with big companies like Volkswagen and BMW. Machinery represented 14.3% of Germany's total exports and chemical products represented around 9%. So together, cars and car parts, machinery and chemicals made up 30%, nearly one third of Germany's exports in 2023. But as energy prices have increased substantially in Germany, it's become more and more difficult to produce these products at a low price and with the cost increasing that decreases the competitiveness of German exports. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this comes at the same time when Germany is being more and more politically subordinated to the United States and Europe as a whole. And in fact, a very mainstream European think tank called the European Council on Foreign Relations, which is based on the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations, they published an article back in 2023 in which they warned that Europe is becoming a vassal of the U.S. They said that the war in Ukraine has revealed Europeans' profound dependence on the U.S. for their security, despite EU efforts at achieving so-called strategic autonomy, and they warn that Europe is becoming an American vassal. Now, of course, this European think tank blamed Russia, but in reality, it's not really Russia, it's actually the United States and NATO. The stronger NATO becomes and the more unified it becomes, the more European nations have subordinated themselves to the United States following orders from Washington. And it was, in fact, the first secretary general of NATO, the British colonial general who oversaw colonial war crimes in Somalia and in other parts of the British Empire, Lord Ismay. He famously said, that NATO was created to, quote, keep the Soviet Union out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. And of course, replace the Soviet Union with Russia today, and it's the same thing. I mean, this slogan is on the NATO website. They don't hide this. They say the goal is to keep Russia out of Europe, the Americans in the alliance with Europe, and the Germans down. And we can see 
that NATO is contributing to the destruction of Germany's economy. And this has very serious consequences. As I'll discuss later, it's also fueling the rise of the far right in Germany. And we should all be very afraid when the far right is back on the rise in Germany of all places. And in terms of deindustrialization in Germany, let's look back at the issue of energy. Now, in 2022, with the war in Ukraine, we saw a massive shift in the sources of energy that, that Germany was importing. In the first six months of 2022, Germany imported about 35% of its gas from Russia, and that has gone basically down to zero, and that much of that has been replaced by Norway. But meanwhile, Germany is spending billions of euros building terminals to import liquefied natural gas, LNG. And where is that LNG coming from? The United States. In fact, in 2023, the United States overtook Qatar as the world's largest exporter of LNG. And Europe is spending a lot of money on that LNG. In fact, Russia estimated that US LNG costs 40% more than the Russian pipeline gas that was previously being sent to countries like Germany and that was powering much of this industry. In fact, this even led some of Washington's allies in Europe to criticize the United States for profiting from the war in Ukraine while Europe has been hurting economically. Politico published an article titled Europe Accuses U.S. of Profiting from War. It notes that top European officials are furious with Joe Biden's administration and now accuse the Americans of making a fortune from the war while EU countries suffer. And they, Politico quoted an anonymous EU official who said, quote, The fact is, if you look at it soberly, the country that is most profiting from the war is the U.S. because they are selling more gas and at a higher price and because they are selling more weapons. Politico also quoted the EU's chief diplomat, Joseph Borrell, who called on Washington to respond to European concerns and said, quote, Americans are friends take decisions which have an economic impact on us. Here we can see this vassalization that European think tanks are warning about. Top EU officials are saying, why are you doing this to us? We love you, we're your friends. Of course, it was the US imperial strategist, Henry Kissinger, who infamously said, America has no permanent friends, only interests. And Europe is learning that the hard way. And of course, let's not forget the Nord Stream pipelines, the two sets of pipelines that Germany had built with Russia in order to provide cheap pipeline gas to power German industry. And those pipelines were blown up. And the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hirsch reported that the United States blew up those pipelines. And the German member of parliament, Savim Dagdalin, a leftist, from a new political party, which I'll talk about later. She accused the US of blowing up the pipeline. She called it a terror attack. And she said that the US is, is turning the EU into vassal states and condemned the NATO proxy war in Ukraine. Savim Dagdalen is part of a new leftist party that is trying to push back against some of these policies. I'll talk about that in a bit. But before that, I should also point out that there are some other people who are benefiting from these higher energy costs in Europe, which is importers. And Politico published a very interesting article titled Why Cheap U.S. Gas Costs a Fortune in Europe. The article noted that many of the companies that are making a fortune selling cheap U.S. gas to the continent at eye-watering markups are in fact European. They know that the liquefied natural gas loaded onto tankers at U.S. ports costs nearly four times more on the other side of the Atlantic. And they note that it's not just U.S. companies, the LNG exporters that are making a fortune on this. It's also European importing companies that are also making huge profits. Politico wrote, it's a big markup for whoever is reselling those LNG cargos into Europe's wholesale market, profiting from fears that there may not be enough gas to last the winter. And in fact, there have been many reports that speculators are making huge profits in Europe off of the massive increases in energy prices. 
In fact, Bloomberg published an article that is quite frankly shocking, showing how speculators in Europe are making billions of dollars profiting as their fellow citizens in, in Europe are suffering economically of a cost of living crisis. And this article noted that in Denmark, there are these new companies that have been set up that use computers and complex trading algorithms with minimal human intervention. They buy millions of euros worth of electricity con contracts, and they're basically betting, they're gambling with these futures contracts. They're putting shorts out and they're essentially making billions of dollars speculating, guessing, betting on where energy prices are going to increase, if gas prices are going to rise or fall. And Bloomberg quoted a consultant who said, quote, it's ridiculous the amount of money they're making. There are billions being made trading electricity in Europe. And I mentioned that this is largely a product of these neoliberal policies, these right wing economic policies pursued by Western European governments. And this article notes where state owned utilities once dominated today, high flying startups full of terribly smart PhDs and young engineers sporting hoodies are running things. Call it the Silicon Valley of European energy trading. So we see this neoliberal technocratic propaganda. Oh, look how smart they are. But in reality, what we see is that these Western governments privatize state owned power utilities. What previously were these natural monopolies that were owned for public benefit through their privatization policies, they created these speculation rackets. And just five years ago, the industry was small with the top firms making a combined net income of about $100 million per year at best. Today, the same companies made $5 billion in profits in 2022. And they have a chart showing this incredible increase. So European governments are further fueling the cost of living crisis with these neoliberal privatization policies, allowing energy speculators to get rich while their people suffer. And here we see another factor that is leading to the economic crisis in Europe, which is greedflation, as it's been called, ex exorbitant, excessive corporate profits that have fueled inflation. Because, of course, there was an inflation crisis that actually is still going on in, the, in Europe. And this originally was caused largely by the supply chain disruptions due to the pandemic. But as we've gone, come out of the pandemic and economies have recovered, inflation has remained persistently high in Europe. And one of those reasons is because of the energy crisis, which I've been discussing, and the loss of cheap Russian energy. But also another significant factor is corporate profits. I published a video and an article, which I will link to in the description below, looking at a study that was done by the International Monetary Fund. IMF economists found that corporate profits contributed for nearly half of all of the inflation in the Eurozone. And of course, Germany is at the heart of the Eurozone's economy. IMF economists estimated that 45% of the inflation in Europe was caused by excessive corporate profits. 40% of the inflation was caused by rising import prices, which is largely due to energy. So between the rising import prices and the excessive corporate profits, that was 85% of the increase in inflation. And, and they only estimated that 15% of the increase in inflation came from increasing wages. But meanwhile, many Western neoliberal economists and politicians blamed inflation on workers' wages and tried to bring down workers' wages and drive up unemployment in order to try to crush demand, to try to bring down inflation. And as if that weren't enough, meanwhile, the German government is imposing austerity policies these neoliberal economic austerity policies that are further exacerbating the recession. I mean, this is the exact opposite of what even mainstream Keynesian economists say, that when you have a recession, the government should be doing the opposite of austerity. It should be spending more, providing a stimulus to increase aggregate demand. Well, Germany, the neoliberal economists, the ordo liberals, as they're called, the neoliberals, who are running German economic policy are imposing austerity measures, which are fueling further recession, further deindustrialization, 
and hurting workers because they have this dogmatic Milton Friedman-esque worldview that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon and they have to depress workers' wages because supposedly it's demand pull inflation, but they're ignoring the elephant in the room, which is the empirical research that shows that the vast majority of the inflation is caused by the energy shock due to rising import prices, and in particular, as a consequence of the Western sanctions on Russia, Germany could end its sanctions on Russia if it wanted to. Germany is the de facto leader of the EU. It could end those sanctions, which are causing economic destruction in Germany and across Europe, but they don't want to end the sanctions on Russia. They want to continue waging this economic war on Russia, this proxy war against Russia, because they want to strengthen the U.S.-led imperialist order, NATO being the primary instrument of U.S. hegemonic domination, not only of the world, but of Europe in particular, which keeps Russia out, the U.S. on top, and Germany down. And meanwhile, German corporations, European corporations, speculators, they are all profiting from this toxic mix of neoliberal economics and imperialist foreign policy. And the people of Germany, the people of Europe are suffering the economic consequences. But on the issue of deindustrialization in Germany and Europe as a whole, there's also another significant factor, which is the US government's policies. Goldman Sachs published research in 2023 that looks at the effects of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, and how it's fueling trillions of dollars of subsidies and tax breaks for companies and incentivizing companies, including in Europe, to move over to the U.S. So this is exacerbating deindustrialization in Europe. Goldman Sachs estimated that the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act will spur about $3 trillion of investment in renewable energy technology. And of course, this is because the U.S. is trying to compete with China. And I'm actually working on a separate video and article, separate report, which, which I will publish soon, looking at how China has become the world's leader in renewable energy technology and how this is driving the West's new Cold War against China. China, not only the US, but also the but Europe is also waging an economic war on China, which is further fueling deindustrialization in Germany. But Goldman Sachs estimated that the US IRA will provide $1.2 trillion of incentives, including subsidies and tax breaks by 2032. And this includes many incentives that make clean technology and storage profitable at a large scale. And these are many of the companies that are competing with German manufacturers. And they note that the IRA's impact could encourage $11 trillion of total infrastructure investments by 2050. By 2032, their analysts estimate there will be $2.9 trillion of cumulative investment opportunity, an average of $209 billion annually. So this means that the U.S. government is providing all of these incentives for companies to instead invest in the United States to build factories in the U.S. Why would they invest in Germany when they know that it's going to be extremely expensive due to the high energy costs? Why would they do that when they can invest in the U.S.? So here we see another example of the U.S. hurting the economy of its so-called European allies. And now finally, this brings me to the last factor that is fueling deindustrialization in Germany, and that is the significant decline in German exports to China, which had long been the most important market for German exports. The Financial Times published a very revealing article titled Big Drop in German Exports to China Raises Fears over EU's economic powerhouse. It noted that a double-digit drop in German exports to China has rattled Europe's biggest economy with an 11.3% drop in German exports to China in the first four months of 2023. Car makers, which remember are the number one export in Germany, car makers are losing market share in China, chemical producers, which are the third biggest exports, Chemical producers and other energy-intensive co companies are reeling from high power prices. 
And the euro's appreciation against the dollar has also made German goods less competitive. And the Financial Times quoted this analyst who said, quote, Germany is now considered to be allies with the U.S., which has led to more explicit or implicit discouraging of purchases of German products. So we see that also the Western new Cold War against China and the economic aggression against China have also fueled this decrease in trade between Germany and China. So this is really a perfect storm fueling deindustrialization in Germany. And of course, it also comes at a time when China has become the world's leading industrial superpower. In fact, I recently published a video in an article precisely about this. I will link to that in the description below. China now represents 35% of the world's gross output of manufacturing production. The US is in second place, Japan is in third place, and Germany is in fourth place. And that is declining more and more by the year. And by the way, it's not just China. In general, as the global south has been economically developing and gradually trying to free itself from Western neocolonialism, we see that several other nations in the global south, along with China, have become significant manufacturing producers. This is a list of the 20 largest manufacturing countries in 2023. And we can see that Russia has been reindustrializing. It's the ninth largest manufacturer. Mexico is the 10th biggest. Indonesia is the 11th biggest. And Indonesia is growing very quickly. It's a, it's a country you should definitely keep your eye on. It has a huge population, a lot of economic potential. Turkey, Turkey is the 12th largest manufacturing producer. Brazil is the 15th largest. And Thailand is the 17th largest. So there is more competition now. So why would people spend more and more on extremely expensive German manufacturing products when they have other options to choose from? So in short, the situation in Germany is very dire and this is fueling political radicalization. In fact, the far right is on the rise once again in Germany and the far right AFD Alternative for Deutschland party has hit record highs in polling. In December of 2023, support for the far-right AFD hit an all-time high of 23%. That puts it at the second highest of, out of all parties in Germany. As context, the current government, which is led you know, as a coalition, which is essentially the centrist coalition of the centrist Social Democratic Party, which has very, very much become neoliberal, they only have 14% support. The Greens, which are a centrist party, really neoliberal, pro-war party, they only have 13% support. And then the, the right-wing neoliberal party, the Free Democrats, center-right, but, but very, you know, so-called pro-business neoliberals, they have 5% support. Now, like many of the far-right parties in Europe, the AFD has been trying to downplay its radical politics and claim, we're just a right-wing populist party, we're just conservatives. But in reality, that narrative is, is not true. Many of its longtime leaders in AFD have been linked to neo-Nazi groups in Germany. And in fact, there was a huge scandal recently in which the German media exposed that leaders of the AFD were meeting with neo-Nazis and other fascists and white supremacists in order to plan mass deportation of immigrants in Germany. But meanwhile, support for this far-right party has been increasing in Germany. And in the past year, AFD's membership increased by 37%. And it's not a mystery why, it's easy to explain. It's because the other mainstream establishment political parties in Germany are all completely the same. They're neoliberal centrists. They basically all agree, including the so-called left-wing Social Democratic Party, which is not in any way left-wing. It is a centrist neoliberal party. The Greens are a right-wing pro-war neoliberal party. They're implementing neoliberal austerity policies right now, right-wing economic policies. And meanwhile, the so-called left, the d Linka party in Germany, also supports the proxy war in Ukraine, the proxy war in Russia, supports the, the new Cold War in China. They are completely pro-imperialist. They support NATO. They're not in any way actually a left-wing party. The only real alternative in Germany 
is a new party that was created by a socialist member of parliament who split off of the Dilinka party. Her name is Sara Wagenacht, and she recently formed a new party. And in fact, a poll showed from January that she could get up to 14% of the vote, which would be a game changer. Because if you go back to the poll published in Reuters in December, they noted that the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, only has 14% support, which is the same, 14. And meanwhile, the SPD currently has the chancellor, Olaf Scholz, who's the current head of state of Germany. Reuters noted that Sara Wagenach's new left-wing party could also deal heavy blows to both the conservatives and the far right. So she is taking votes away from the right wing and far right forces in Germany. This poll found that Sara Wagenach's new left wing party, which is actually anti-war, which opposes NATO imperialism, opposes the proxy war against Russia and Ukraine, that this party could take four percentage points away from the far right AFD and it could take three points away from the conservative party, putting them at only 27%. That's the Christian Democratic Party, which is the party of the former longtime chancellor, Angela Merkel. And by the way, earlier I mentioned another leftist member of parliament in the Bundestag in Germany, Sevim Dagdalen. She also left the, she withdrew from the left party, the so-called left party, which is actually not a left-wing party. Her, and she also joined this new real leftist party led by Sarah Wagenacht, which is actually anti-war, anti-imperialist, and also proposes socialist economic policies. And I did an interview with Savim Dagdalin in which she condemned the NATO proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. She condemned the U.S. terror attack on the Nord Stream pipelines. And she said that Europe is becoming a vassal of the United States. So there are a few alternatives that are emerging in Europe. And this is in response to the severe crisis that Germany is in and in general, all of Europe is in. And people are waking up and realizing that this is a product of the West's new Cold War against both Russia and China. As EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell said back in 2022, Europe's economic prosperity, the, the basis of its economic model was China and Russia, cheap energy from Russia and the big market in China. And now this new Cold War is eroding that economic base and it's fueling political crisis in Europe. And what's most concerning of all is that across the continent, we see the rise of far right parties, which are exploiting this economic discontent, but they're scapegoating immigrants. They're scapegoating environmentalism and green policies, which are not responsible for this crisis. Everything that I've detailed today, it's not because of green policies and environmentalism. Climate change is a very serious problem, but it's Europe's political subordination to the United States in these imperialist wars that are backfiring and hurting Europe. In fact, the claim that Germany is pursuing green policies is actually contradicted by the government's decision to bring back coal-fired power plants in the winter of 2023, in, in particular because it did not have enough natural gas to meet demand. Reuters reported on this saying that it was a result of a sudden drop in Russian gas imports to Germany, not mentioning the Western sanctions on Russia and, of course, the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines. But here we can see the hypocrisy of the German government's supposed commitment to green policies. Once again, the Western governments that talk about fighting climate change are very hypocritical. It's actually China that is leading the world in the fight against climate change and in the transition toward renewable energies and green technologies. I'm gonna be explaining that in a separate video I'll be posting soon. But here you can see that people trying to blame the energy crisis and deindustrialization in Germany on green policies are missing the forest for the trees. The problem is not the green policies. The problem is the suicidal geopolitical decisions taken by the European leadership, which has voluntarily kowtowed 
to the United States and outsourced all of their policymaking to Washington, allowing the U.S. to basically control them. So it's difficult to be optimistic about what's going on in Europe, but I will always be here reporting on the geopolitics and economics of the situation so you can actually understand what's going on. And if you like this kind of reporting that we do here at Geopolitical Economy Report, please like and subscribe, please share this video. And if you prefer listening, instead, all of our videos are available as a podcast. If you look up the Geopolitical Economy Report podcast, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. If you really like the work that we do, please consider supporting us. You can donate in several ways. If you go to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support, the best way is you can go to patreon.com slash geopoliticaleconomy and become a patron. It helps sustain our work. We are completely independent. We have no institutional support. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners like you. I'm Ben Norton, the editor of Geopolitical Economy Report. I want to thank you for joining us. I will see you all next time.